Yeah, it's my great pleasure to, to welcome Frank Dressel here to the CASO's annual workshop. And um, Frank is uh, a theoretical physicist from, from background and graduated at TU Dresden in 2008. And then Frank continued um, his career in both IT industry and academics. And uh, on the way, he became uh, a full stack software developer with expertise in data science and project development, prototyping and much other things beyond. And so in other words, Frank knows how to address challenges in computations from in, within both worlds. So uh, in academics and professional software development. And in 2019, he became the acting head of uh, software methods uh, within the German Aerospace Center DLR here in Dresden which is located next to the computer science campus at TU. So we can drop by there quite easily. Um, and one of his uh, main research interests is asking for when to use or how to trust digital trends, which thereby, so of course, perfectly matching the scope of our workshop. And so with, I'm looking really forward to, to the talk and without further ado, uh, Frank, the screen is yours, so please. Yeah, so thanks, Michael, for the nice introduction and thanks to the organizer for the great um, workshop. Um, I'm currently getting an error message when I try to, yeah, no, uh, perfect. So let me share my screen. So, <clears throat> Uh, welcome to my talk, how can we trust um, digital twins? Um, today, I would like to um, discuss um, what we can do with the results of um, digital twins and how can we um, trust it and reuse it. And because the term is not so well defined, um, I will give you some examples uh, in the aviation domain, both from within DLR, but also from uh, within industry to see how others are using it despite what we already saw in the last days and the great talks. Um, I will highlight based on the examples, which I picked um, based on my understanding of a digital twin. So we can discuss it afterwards if it's um, complete or not, but at least in the examples, I will show you there are some problematic attributes which I would like to discuss with you. And I will make a proposal on how we trust, uh, how we be able to trust results of digital twins and of the uh, data and simulation workflows which are in such a system. And I will show you a sketch of how it can be implemented. And yeah, it's clear that there will be a summary and outlook. <clears throat> so, um, currently, there's no real definition of a digital twin which is shared by both industry and research. Um, in the beginning of the conference, we had uh, a definition where it was said it's a comprehensive and multi-scale uh, representation of, um, for example, a real object. And that's one common definition, which uh, especially in research uh, you see a lot, but it's not necessarily what the industry is uh, using it for. And because there's no so clear definition in the latest years, you have some um, approaches to try to look at literature and analyze what other people are publishing to get some understanding of what's, what digital twin really means. And um, here on the right, you see um, some results of a study from 2020 from Van der Waag, uh, and we looked at different dimensions. And what's quite important, at least in the uh, some, 500 somehow paper we analyzed is that, for example, you have a bidirectional data link, which means um, you have a real object, which um, is somehow uh, coupled data-wise with your digital representation in both directions. So you send data also from the digital representation to your real object, for example, to control it. Um, the accuracy is important for some of them, but not, um, for all of the applications of digital twins. And that's also what you see when you look at industry. So we have very specialized use cases where we need accuracy just at certain parts of the digital representation. Um, 
what's more or less uh, existing in all of the uh, use cases where you looked at is synchronization. So you really have a uh, more or less real-time um, status update from your object, from your real object, which is digitally represented to your um, model. And because there's no really clear definition and also the dim dimensions uh, we found here in the um, study are not so well defined, uh, especially when you look at the industry use cases, you will often find digital twin more or less used as a marketing term. So um, there are use cases in industry and partly also in research where it's essentially just a data management system. Uh, but I think we all agree that a digital twin is a little bit more than that. Um, and there's another a study from this year where we tried to somehow define the term based on what a digital twin can or cannot be used for. And also with um, classification, I think it's not very um, ideal because for example, uh, we assume that you really have um, the update from the digital uh, representation to a real object. And only if that's the case, they call it digital twin and the other um, case, they call it, for example, digital um, shadow, which you see on the um, image on the bottom. And yes, that's a term which is used uh, when you look from the IT perspective, um, but it's as vague as digital twin. So also with classification in my um, sense, doesn't really um, help. It's a nice approach and it's a good, it's a nice um, publication, but it doesn't help us really to define uh, what, it, what a digital twin is or what the main problems are in there. Um, so I will show you some examples from within DLR and from within industry, which um, maybe helps us to um, get a feeling for uh, what other people mean when we talk about digital twin. Uh, also besides uh, research. So the first example um, I will show you is the iStar. Uh, I will just show it very briefly. Uh, you maybe know that the uh, DLR has a lot of uh, research airplanes and the iStar is uh, one of them. So essentially it's uh, this old Falcon jet, which is reconfigured with a lot of um, sensors and which allows us to get real live data stream of the relevant uh, flight systems. And we should be accompanied with a digital twin. So it's currently built up and we'll start with the um, engines, the um, projects for that are ongoing, where we can really look at the, fun uh, the data management and the functionality, uh, all the simulations, so that we can really get an understanding what's going on with the uh, airplane when it's flying. So, um, that's the, the hardware part. But if you look um, also on the IT part and simulation part, there are also some ongoing activities, uh, one where I'm involved, uh, for example, the virtual product house. Um, it's an end-to-end -end process for a wing movable where we really try to start from a configuration file, which essentially describes which flight maneuvers you would like to do, how the wing is, uh, built and so on. And when all the steps which you normally would have um, in the real world are simulated. So you start with the design phase where you build the CAD models and so on. You have a virtual manufacturing where you look at all the materials which are used. You have virtual test tricks. And in the end, the idea is that you can take the results from such a virtual process and get a certification for that. And the interesting thing here with process um, I will come to it uh, later on in a little bit more detail. Um, is a distributed process. So you have a lot of different stakeholders, different institutes involved, which work together remotely and sharing um, the data and the um, tools. And there are also other uh, projects ongoing, a lot of them, um, where we look at the common data storage um, across different systems. So um, for example, some data management systems which uh, can act as a single source of truth, which is something you also observe in industry quite often. Um, we're doing research for metadata, provenance and traceability topics, um, integration of data and workflow management, um, and also the virtual certification. And 
I think if we uh, try it, it's quite interesting because we have a live hardware we can, where we can get the data from. Um, we have the physics-based simulation for developing the components, but also to test it. And we have the um, data processing power. And that's quite interesting combination to be able to do research for digital twins in aviation. And the interesting thing is, and um, that's also a reference to the talk we had yesterday um, by um, Giovanni about the energy grids, where he was validating the um, simulations with real hardware to test it and showcase that it's really uh, working. Here we have something um, similar because in the aviation domain, uh, we have very hard constraints with respect um, to safety and everything you would like to change on an airplane uh, needs to be certified by the EASA, the European Aviation um, Safety Agency. And when we use the digital tools here, we are also applying for this process. So we have to validate the tools, verify it, discuss with the EASA officers if it's okay or not. So um, all the tools we are using here are on a very high uh, level with respect to the physics uh, which way model. And um, the interesting thing is the tools which were used for simulation of a wing or a component of an airplane uh, are also the same tools which are used in a digital twin when you um, try to model an actual built airplane. So um, that's quite um, interesting aspect. And the second one is, um, again, because due to the certification, we also have a similar problems like um, Professor it seems mentioned yesterday with um, the long time uh, scales for which data needs to be available. So his patient data, uh, he was talking about 20 to 30 years and we have something similar because the um, uh, data from certified aircrafts also need to be available and usable. And we are here talking also about decades, 10, 20 uh, or even more years. And um, within the LR, because we have um, the digital tools in the beginning, but we're also used for the digital twin in the end, um, we have solution of the so-called virtual product, which is in our understanding, really the digital description of the whole aircraft with all the components, properties and interactions along the whole um, life cycle from the first requirements to the end of the life. So that's the um, virtual product. It's one of the guiding, pros, uh, guiding concepts of um, DLR. And we're not just looking at the digital twins. And everything which I will um, tell you later on applies to digital twins, but it's also um, somehow based on this version of the, the virtual product. Um, that's our research um, part when you look at <clears throat> examples from industry, where essentially um, three main focuses, um, I think, in industry. It's first of all, uh, building models and simulation um, that's similar to what we had in the last days with very detailed models to understand the problem. Um, the second focus, I think, is connecting the data uh, from different processes and the third one, IoT. And I don't want to go too much in detail. I just recommend, um, for example, this talk, which is linked here. It's from the Hannover Messe with here, where a guy from a company uh, which built wind parks and maintain wind parks show what we do with digital twins and we, for example, have, a, have digital models coming from the design, from the CAT um, models. Um, we have a model for each of the wind turbine with the sensors integrated and when we're, some of the sensors indicate a problem, an engineer can really look at the model, dissect it, gets highlighted which parts uh, are problematic and when we have machine learning and AL, AI algorithms in place to um, highlight possible root courses. And um, that's quite impressive, but still it's a one way um, data transfer. And although it's a lot of data management and interesting technology behind um, from IT perspective, it's um, I would say a medium complex um, system. Um, the second aspect, the data connectivity, you will find a lot of in the industry. And here's one very simple example, I would say, from the Industrial Digital Twin Association, the digital nameplate. And essentially, it's just a QR code on a device, and the user 
of the device can scan it and gets um, connected to the manual, to the documentation, to the certifications of the device and so on. And um, on the first glance, it looks a little bit static because I mean, the manual will maybe not change so much, um, but it's dynamic when you think about the certification issues, for example, when a new certification um, certificate is issued, um, it can be automatically updated. So there's quite some benefit for the industry um, to use such systems. And the interesting thing, the data connectivity doesn't stop where um, you really see that it's also connecting all the processes, the engineering processes, which are ongoing. For example, model-based system engineering, uh, product lifecycle management. We are all try to fit all the data from all the engineering processes together in systems, which we call digital twins. And the last focus, the IoT part, um, I think it's um, yeah mainly based on the sensor input um, and on big data techniques. And here's one example, for example, from Norway, uh, also linked with the uh, video. And we used some kind of predictive maintenance to block uh, bridges before something um, severe happens and we try to repair the bridges uh, based on um, sensor input and some machine learning models in the background. So that's the um, IT industry, industry, uh, the, uh, industry examples. And um, in most cases, the systems are not too complex, but we um, have some benefits for the um, industry and the users. So uh, based on with um, examples, I see some problematic attributes. So one is that you have automatic data updates from the object, whatever it is, to your digital representation. And um, which may cause some problems because you're using in a digital twin maybe algorithms where you have some implicit assumptions about what kind of parameters we are working on. And um, if something completely out of range comes in, um, you maybe will get unreliable results out without even noticing it. So that's something which needs, needs to be um, tracked. The other thing is you have quite some complex correlation between the data because you have multiple data sources, data categories combined um, sensor values, um, digital models, and so on and so forth. And especially if you have some bi-directional um, data transfer, if it even gets more complicated because you can have some um, feedback. And the same, which is true for the data, is also true for the functionality. Within the digital twins, we're using simulation tools. We have chains of different tools, maybe also from external suppliers. We have uh, black box approaches uh, like um, some of the artificial intelligence and machine learning methods and so on. And when you look from the outside, a digital twin on the first glance is black box and it's difficult to understand. And we have a lot of different components, some independent, some dependent. And last thing is, um, that the data which comes out from a digital twin is in some cases um, used elsewhere in different organizations at different time points, where you maybe not the same systems available to really check it or to uh, redo the calculations. Um, data may be changed, but it should be mutable at least uh, when you transfer it from time to time or from different stakeholders. And um, I expect, especially for the future, that the twin components uh, will be distributed. Um, we have some examples in our projects already now, uh, but with all the this ongoing discussions with cloud and functions as a services, I really expect for the future that a digital twin is not just located in one um, computing center, but it will definitely be distributed. And um, when I think at digital twins come be composed of different sub twins. We already saw examples in the last days, for example, in the talk uh, by um, White Hagenmeier with the energy grids, where he showed two different twins which were um, coupled. So, with this problematic attribute, the question is how to trust it. And 
maybe now with um, Cinevin um, framework and one of the uh, um, main points you have uh, interesting situations, let's say like that, is that you have to sense something. And uh, when you work with data, sensing means essentially um, know what's going on, understanding the data flow, understanding the uh, people which were involved, the expertise, perhaps the tools involved, and understanding what the algorithms and the tools were doing. Um, it's also one of the requirements in my um, understanding that the results um, are immutable, which just means when I look back in two weeks time, I still get the same results uh, where stored somewhere. And I don't want to have a closed system with some specific technology because I cannot be sure what's really going on in there. So um, data storage and the data usage should really be technology neutral. And when you are talking about trust, we already heard it in the last days, you also have the aspects of security and IP, which I will skip for today's talk um, and just uh, concentrate on the uh, points above. And where I think provenance, which essentially means the um, information, where the data is coming from, what was done to it um, my help. But the important question here is um, how to bring the data, which is generated in our systems and our digital twins and the um, information about its origin together. <clears throat> and one approach which I think uh, can be used for that, um, and we are doing research uh, on that, is uh, a construct we call provenance container. It's essentially a data container which is self-describing and contains the provenance and the data. And um, for recording what was done to the data, for recording the provenance, there's already quite some established models. For example, the W3C provenance model. You see on the image um, on the left, and it's more or less the um, standard. And it's quite simple. So you have essentially three things, entities, which um, represent your data, maybe a file, maybe data streams, whatever. You have your activities which uh, produce the data and which can use it. Um, and you have the agents, the tools, the people uh, responsible and involved in the process. And you see there are some relations in between that. And the important thing is with simple model already forms a directed acyclic graph, which essentially means when you have something, some artifact, a data entity, you can really trace it back through all the step, what was done with it, what activity was performed, um, what was used, what data was used for this activity, which people were involved and so on. And you can trace it back until you get the primary sources, for example, um, for the energy grid um, talk we had in the last days, um, uh, whether the weather uh, sources, um, weather information may be such primary sources. And you can really trace it back based on the simple model. And um, what we are doing now, we are taking the provenance based of an instance of such a model and stored as JSON, which is essentially a machine and human readable, and stored in an additional file. Um, and the file name we use for that is essentially the uh, hash sum over the content. And we do the same with the data. And again, the data file is renamed um, to the hash sum of the uh, content. And um, when we have two files, you see on the image um, on the right, and with two file construct, we call a provenance container. And within the provenance, we store a reference to the data, essentially, it's just a reference to the hash sum. Um, we don't do it the other way around, um, and that's for a reason. Um, we really think um, when you work with data, you should make sure what data it is, who produced it, uh, which tool was involved, and so on, before you use it. So you should really start with provenance, and um, the claim is provenance first. Uh, and once you look at the provenance information, you can already get the data while um, lookup. And because we, you see um, hash names here, the hash sum, um, it's um, some kind of content addressable, both the data and the provenance itself, which means you can use any key value uh, or key file store, which is available. In the easiest case, that's your file system. In more advanced cases, you can 
uh, build index systems or use peer-to-peer -peer networks, it's all possible. And <clears throat> let me show you on one example um, how we implemented it. So with again, the end-to-end uh, -end process for the virtual certification of a wing mobile from the virtual product house. And here we have five different DLR institutes, uh, one academic partners and some industry partners involved. And you see here on the image some yellow boxes and the yellow boxes are tools which were provided by different partners and are running on remote sites. And we only have the data transfer indicated by the lines here. And the data transfer now was done with the Chromelance container. So whenever a tool was started, we had a pre-processing step which essentially takes such a container, extracts the provenance information, um, the tool was running, and the result was again put to such a container layout with additional information now about the tool run, about the user who started it, about some static information, about the tool versioning, and so on and so forth. Everything which we think is relevant um, for the traceability and when the whole uh, package was um, sent to the next tool. Um, here's an example on uh, how it looks like on left. Um, you see it, um, output of the JSON um, provenance information on the right. You see, for example, the data content in this case, it's an XML file. And if you look closely, you see in the middle, you have the reference um, to a so-called data hash, which essentially is the name of the um, data file. Um, with this um, container layout, um, we are able to fulfill the requirements I mentioned before. So we can understand the data. Um, we can check uh, who was involved, which person, if it has expertise enough, we can see which, uh, which algorithms were um, involved. And still it's a super simple uh, layout. So whenever you store your data, you already have your data management system. And it, it's super easy to just store one additional file. On the other hand, um, because it's human and machine readable, you can also combine it with other data management systems, your PLM um, systems and so on. Um, we have some uh, cool properties of this approach. It's content addressable, I already um, said so. So in the future, I expect digital twins to be distributed systems. So uh, with layout already, um, helps and with because it doesn't matter where you store it. It just, um, the only thing which is needed is that you're able to somehow look it up and that's guaranteed with the um, hash sums. Um, it's immutable because whenever you change something, you see that the name is changing. Um, it's self-describing. We have all the information we need and can be um, extended. And yeah, it's technology neutral because um, where are a lot of tools which can deal with JSON. There are some prices to pay. We have non-speaking names, which can be mitigated um, with data management systems again, but yeah, that's a negative point. Uh, you have two artifacts instead of one, and especially when you look at HPC um, environment, since it's something we will um, doing research for in the future, um, you may have some problems with um, collecting the data because it takes time, it takes memory, although it's not much um, in um, HPC, it may uh, be a problem. So that's something we will look at. Um, we also have some measures to look at the algorithms. and uh, I don't want to go into detail here. Um, it's partly a combination of uh, common sense for software development, but it's also um, we also really specify it in detail to get engineers who develop the workflows and the tools um, get to the point that it's important to um, have a lot of test data and to really do something like um, functional duct typing. So you have so much test data that you can describe your tool only based on the test data. That's the idea behind that. And this, especially if you look at um, current maybe trends, it's still in discussion if it will work out in the future or not. Um, something like indistinguishable uh, obfuscation where you um, cannot really, um, you just get the results from your um, tool, but can you really uh, look up the source code? Um, 
which means the only thing to make sure that the tool is doing what it should is um, compare test data and look at the outputs. And for that, you need examples. And it's an important point, which uh, we would like to uh, highlight. And also that it's um, reconstructable and you really showed it that you have long-term storage um, and that you can understand your tools, which essentially means you sometimes should use different um, algorithms um, which are explainable. For example, there's one study from 2020 um, I linked here where we switched from neural network model to a tree-based model um, in um, modeling um, uh, airplane, virtual airplane. And the explanation for switching to a tree-based model was explicitly that we would like to have something which is directly explainable by the sensor while you still had sensors, for example, on a on the wing of the airplane. And the model we came up with in the end was really understandable when sensor A on wing, on the first wing, has a value of 10. Um, the airplane behaves according to some model. And you can really, based on tree-based um, approach, you can really see where the um, switches between different behavior uh, was done. So I skipped security and I skipped it in the beginning because um, I think we already have some technologies available for that. And I just um, noted down some of them here. So we have the authorization um, systems, encryption, and so on. Uh, there's also a technology aspect to trust, but also where I think we already have some good technologies available. Uh, like data management systems. We have data exchange formats, CPEX, um, asset administrative shells, and so on, which we all can work with the container layout I presented here. But if you don't like to use it, you um, can still use uh, one of the existing technologies. And uh, one last part, I was talking about provenance a lot, uh, but there's also the provenance of the tools itself, the software provenance, which I skipped here. Um, but it's also one of the points you really have to take into account when you try to trace your data through complex systems like digital twins. Uh, I skipped it here because I think on a first, uh, for the first step, we really should look at the data. And based on that, we can extend the uh, methodology. So how should, how should it look like in the end? Uh, a user gets some data and he asks himself what's going on there. Uh, based on the provenance information which is available, he at least can try to somehow look up the data flow and based on the um, data flow and the information provided for each of the data pieces, you get an understanding on what was done. And still it's unclear what the algorithms are doing, but when you have um, explainable um, algorithms, he should also be able to understand at least broadly what's going on based on the test data, based on the documentation, um, based on some internals of the algorithms, which he can look up. So in the end, the user should really be able to um, assess what was done to the data, how it was produced, and decide if he trusts it or not. So the key ingredient for such a digital twin, um, in my understanding, provenance of data and algorithm explanations with uh, whatever methodology you would like to use. Um, and essentially, this means in the end, whenever you ingest data in your digital twin, you have to make sure that you can provide some, um, some information to it. Um, if it's an external data source, um, you are in control on using it. So at least you can provide some information where it's coming from. In the case of weather, weather data, for example, is it coming from the... Um, DVD from Deutsche Wetterdienst or from another system and so on. And the same is true within a digital twin. If you lose, use, for example, tools from other partners, external tools, you are still knowing what you are embedding and you can provide this information and really makes the whole process a little bit more traceable. So in summary, I think the traceability and the understanding of the uh, data and of the results of a digital twin is possible with um, provenance among other uh, measures. And um, I think provenance and data needs to be really be associated and not just that 
when you have some kind of data, you have to look in some um, data or metadata management system where you explicitly have to ask access to. So whenever you have data, you also should be able to have some provenance for that. So it needs to be a super simple um, format and the container I showed here and the provenance first approach is one way to do it. Uh, I think in the future, we will have a lot of distributed environments, much more when we have now and especially much more um, like industries are doing currently. So we have to embrace with distributed environments, which essentially means uh, we need some way to look up our um, traceability information, provenance and the data. And I think the approach um, presented here is a first step to that. So essentially, I think uh, we are already building digital twins a lot. Um, now it's time to look at how we can trace data within it, explain our algorithms. And when a user of the um, digital twins, which is maybe not we who built it, um, is able to uh, trust the data and the results from it. Yeah, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and are um, happy for the discussion. Thank you very much, Frank. And um, with that, I, I open uh, for questions. So if I should miss someone who raises his hand, then please let me know. Okay, so uh, at the moment, I don't see uh, a question, but then uh, I have a couple of my of my own. So <clears throat> thanks of all for, for, for the great talk. And um, one of the questions I have is whether you have also, let's say an automated conflict resolve scheme within the digital twin. So if now you may exchange one of the, of the components and then and now this predicts something else than Priorum, and then, then you have to resolve it, whether you have somehow an automated scheme, which then maybe on, on some augmentative uh, reasoning uh, knows which one to prefer. Mm. Um, <clears throat> no, there's no um, such system, and it's not there for a reason, because um, the uh, approach we're using here is whenever you generate piece of data with a given tool, um, it will not change anymore. So um, let's say you have your digital twin, which uses some kind of uh, weather data, maybe historical data, it doesn't matter. Uh, and you get result A. And now you, um, now you exchange the data source and have, um, whatever other input data and you get result B. Um, in both cases, we assume um, that both results are valid and are stored somewhere and based on the provenance, it's two different results. So um, if you change something in the system, you will get definitely a new result. You will never update your results and whatever comes out of a digital twin or of a tool will stay forever. Um, that's the philosophy behind, which may be problematic, um, especially if you um, have high volume data um, and you really have to make the decision what is important to you with respect to understanding your data and to trace it and where to um, where to make this um, container. It may be the case that it's not every detailed step of your processing pipeline or of your um, digital twin, um, maybe just the result of it or just some important um, sub steps. Um, but in principle, our philosophy is whenever you produce something, it's stored um, forever. Thank you. I see a question from, from uh, Omar, so. Uh... Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for your nice talk, Frank. 
Um, I had one, maybe two questions. Um, so the first one actually goes a bit in the same direction as, as the question just before. Um, but I was wondering a bit more uh, about specifically about invalidating data. So what do you do like in your system if you realize a certain uh, piece of data or, or a data set um, should be dropped because, because for some reason uh, the whoever provided the data um, notified you that this data was useless or there was some mistake or something wrong and it should be discarded. Is there a way to do that within your system? I mean, you say that data stays yep. forever. Um, so you would simply do a data update and then there's, and, and you have some sort of time stamping or versioning system that comes along with it where you know which is the most up-to-date um, uh, version yep. of that data? Yeah, that's an interesting question um, <clears throat> because um, when you look at whatever people are doing with um, provenance or metadata, in many systems you have centralized um, data management or metadata management systems uh, where this information is stored and linked to some data sets. And um, whenever something was updated, we delete the old data set and just keep a reference to that. Um, in our case, we assume that we have systems where data is constantly distributed across system boundaries and to other stakeholders. And if you calculate something and you send it to another stakeholder, um, and after that you recognize, oh damn, I made a mistake, um, you cannot make sure that it's deleted um, because you send it already to someone where you have no control about what he's doing with the data. Um, so the only possibility you have in such a scenario is to send a completely new data set with new provenance, which is updated, um, and hope that he is doing the right um, thing with that. Um, it will be uh, completely traceable because if something on the data has changed, it means also the hash sum is uh, changed of the data set. Um, and which will both be reflected in the provenance, but also in the data itself, on the name of the uh, of the ID of the uh, data. Um, but we explicitly not delete or update something. So whenever a piece of data is produced, and you as designer of the system uh, are the opinion that this is so important that it should be in such a container and it should needs the provenance, um, each of these produced construct uh, provenance container is immutable forever. It will not be updated and not be um, deleted. I, I mean, you can delete it on your hard drive, but um, um, you cannot force it for other people who may be already using it. Okay, with that maybe I have another question, uh, if you don't mind, and this is uh, as you sketched that you then of course have a workflow testing, right, so you have the digital twin set up, and then you, you test it, and my question is in, in, your, in your talk you sketched it as a, as a feed forward process, right, without feedbacks. My question is, is this really the case, or is, has the workflow feedbacks, and in case it has feedbacks, how do you resolve them? Um, <clears throat> it was just um, to sketch something. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, for yeah. sure, you uh, may have um, the feedback. And with the uh, testing of the whole digital twin, that's an interesting um, question. Uh, um, so that may also is a, is a comment for potential collaboration, because I mean, yeah. Um, if you would look at the dependency graph of the workflow, right, how you run and then maybe come back and have feedbacks and so on, then this is a directed graph. And for, for running such workflows, you need to cut this graph in just you know, feed forward graphs in order to, to simulate. And exactly to finding the minimal cuts of such a dependency graph is an, an classical, a classic uh, NP complete problem for which we have uh, established a reasonable heuristic, which is quite yep. efficiently and very close. And um, yeah, so I would, would maybe love to, to take that deeper at the point. Yeah, 
me too. That's something uh, we can um, discuss, and I would be uh, very happy to discuss it. Thanks a lot. So I don't see any further questions here in the audience. And if this is the case, then I thank you very much again, Frank, and, and uh, looking forward for uh, a discussion on the, on the subject we have recently uh, spoken about. Um, and in this case, I would say I hand back to Martin to uh, introduce the next speaker.